day everyone, I am John Alejo, your second presenter. In the previous presenter, you have already learned about the definition, proponents, concept, and the first part of the aspect of psychoanalytic criticism. As a continuation, I will be discussing the rest of the aspects, the relation of Freud's psychoanalysis to the literature, its benefits, disadvantages, and an example. The next aspect of psychoanalytic criticism was Oedipus complex. Sigmund Freud introduced the term Oedipus complex in his interpretation of dreams in 1899. According to him, the Oedipus complex involves children's need for their parents and the conflict that arises as children mature and realize they are not the absolute focus of their mother's attention. Freud believed that the Oedipus complex was one of the most powerfully determinative elements in the growth of the child that normally begins in a late phase of infantile sexuality. During Freud's stages of psychosexual development, he suggested that children go through a process during the genital stage where they initially view their same-sex parent as a rival for the opposite-sex parent affections. In order to resolve this conflict, they repressed these feelings of aggression. Freud pointed out, however, that the Oedipus complex differs in boys and girls. For boys, these feelings are known as the Oedipal complex. It is traditionally used to describe a boy's attraction towards the mother and sense of rivalry with father. While for the analogous feelings in young girls are called Electra complex, where it described a girl's attraction towards the father and a sense of rivalry with mother. Freud believed that the impact of unconscious id, ego, and superego, the defense and the Oedipus complex, was inescapable and that these elements of the mind influence of all our behavior and even our dreams as adults. Of course, this behavior also influences what we write. So the next aspect is the id, ego, and the superego. First is the id or raw design. The id is defined as a part of the psyche that stems from the pleasure principle. The id operates at an unconscious level and focuses solely on instinctual drives and desires. According to Freud, there are two biological instincts that make up the id. First is the eros or the instinct to survive that drive us to engage in life-sustaining activities. And the natus, or the death instinct, that drives destructive, aggressive, and violent behavior. Our id is the largest primal part of ourself, and it is our base of our instincts and wants. The id is the most primitive of the three structures, and is concerned with instant gratification of basic physical needs and urge. It operates entirely unconsciously outside of the conscious thought. For example, if your id walked past a stranger eating ice cream, it would most likely to take the ice cream for itself. It doesn't know or care that it is rude to take something belonging to someone else. It would care only that you wanted the ice cream. The next one is the ego. In order to control our primal desires or id, we have the ego. The ego is the rational part of the psyche. However, most of the activities done within the ego is unconscious. The id and the ego work in harmony between the pleasure principle and the reality principle. The ego works to meet the id's needs in a socially appropriate way. It is the most tied to reality and begins to develop in infancy. In contrast to the instinctual id and the moral superego, the ego is the rational, pragmatic part of our personality. It is less primitive than the id and it is partly conscious and partly unconscious. It is what Freud considered to be the self and its job is to balance the demands of the id and the superego in the practical context of reality. So for example, so if you walk past the stranger with ice cream one more time, your ego would mediate a conflict between your id that would say, I want that ice cream right now, and superego would say, it's wrong to take someone else ice cream and decide to go buy your own ice cream. While this may mean you have to wait 10 more minutes, which would frustrate your id, your ego decides to make the sacrifice as part of the compromise, satisfying your desire for ice cream while also avoiding an unpleasant social situation and potential feelings of shame. 
Lastly, the superego. The superego is the sensor of the psyche and it abides by the morality principle. The superego is the portion of the mind in which morality and higher principles reside, encouraging us to act in socially and morally acceptable ways. The superego is concerned with social rules and morals, similar to what many people call their conscience or their moral compass. It develops as a child learns what their culture considered right and wrong. For example, if your superego walked past the same stranger, it would not take their ice cream because it would know that it would be rude. However, if both your id and your superego were involved, and your id was strong enough to override your superego's concern, you would still take the ice cream, but afterward, you would most likely feel guilt and shame of, over your actions. So what does all of this psychological business have to do with literature? To put it simply, some critics believe that we can read psychoanalytically to see which concepts are operating the text in such a way as to enrich our understanding of the work and if we plan to write a paper about it to yield a meaningful, coherent, psychoanalytic interpretation. Freud further expanded the connection between literature and psychoanalysis. He compared fantasy, play, dreams, and the work of art in order to understand creativity. One interesting feature of this approach is that it validates the importance of literature as it is built on a literary key for their decoding. This critical endeavor seeks evidence of unresolved emotion, psychological conflicts, guilt, ambivalences, and so forth within what may well be a disunified literary work. The author's own childhood traumas, family life, sexual conflicts, fixations, and such will be traceable within the behavior of the characters in the literary work. But psychological material will be expressed indirectly, disguised, or encoded like dreams through principles such as symbolism, condensation, and displacement. Despite the importance of the author here, psychoanalytic criticism is similar to new criticism in which it is not concerning itself with what the author intended but what the author never intended is soft. So what are the benefits in using psychoanalytical criticism? First, outside of knowing of the author's life to understand the text, psychologically, readers can also understand the character's mind by what they go through within the story, especially if they have psychological problems. Psychoanalytic help us to understand the issues that have caused deeply rooted problems and a maladaptive perspective in life. Psychoanalysis assists the reader in adopting a fresh viewpoint that gains new attitude and can generate significant change and growth in the reader's life. Another benefit is that this literary criticism provides us with lenses which ultimately reveal important aspects of the literary work. This focuses on three main phases that includes the author, the text, and the reader. These lenses that will provide an in-depth understanding about the literary work. Like all forms of literary criticism, psychoanalytic criticism can yield useful clues to the sometimes symbols, actions, and settings in a literary work. What are the disadvantages in using this criticism? First, psychological criticism can turn a work into a little more than a psychological case study neglecting to view it as a piece of art. Critics sometimes attempt to diagnose long-dead authors based on their works, which is perhaps not the best evidence for their psychology. Next is, psychoanalytic criticism has its limits. For one thing, some critics rely on psychocriticism as one-size-fits-all approach, when in fact, no one approach can adequately make sense of a complex work of art. Next, Psychoanalytics serves to confuse instead of clarify ideas. What the author never intended is thought, and therefore the unconscious material has been distorted by the censoring conscious minds. Readers can easily misinterpret through this lens. When a person suffers psychologically, the conscious mind is unable to process the experience and categorize it rationally. Critics argue that literary texts like dreams, express the secret, unconscious desires and anxieties of the author, that a literary work is a manifestation of the author's own neurosis. Lastly, 
Psychoanalytic criticism can often be sexist. Some critics believe that this criticism tends to link the text directly to the sexuality of the author or the character and this criticism tends to see sex in everything exaggerating this aspect of literature. For example, one of Edgar Allan Poe's best work, The Cast of Amontillado, is filled with irony. The character Montvisor is filled with psychological concept known as it, as he acts on his own desires and impulses without even feeling guilty. While Montresor is fueled by the element of it, Fortunato's concept is a shadow projection. Therefore, based on a psychological approach, one would theorize that Pa expresses two different aspects of himself, one side portraying him as the victim and the other portraying him as the root of all evil. By utilizing psychological criticism, one can conclude that Paul's life and experience have a legitimate effect on the character's own complex psychology. For example, Montresor represents a dark and charismatic character as he tempts Fortunato with Amontillado to proceed towards the cellar and catacombs. This individual doesn't seem to feel any slight regret towards the crime he committed against Fortunato as he is able to remember every detail of the event, despite the fact that it has been approximately 50 years. Poe begins by describing in characteristically precise and logical detail Montresor's or Poe's idea of perfect revenge. However, some could speculate that at least for a brief moment, he felt a certain amount of affection for Fortunata. Montresor actually refers to Fortunato as my friend and my poor friend six times and seems to be giving him multiple chances to escape his fate. Fortunato, on the other hand, has his own fair share of psychological alignments. For example, Fortunato seems to suffer from alcohol addiction as this is precisely how Montresor is able to draw him towards his lair and bring him to his demise. He had a weak point and though other regards him as a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. As a result, Fortunato was abnormally warm, gullible, and trusting towards Montessor even when under the influence of any alcohol. Additionally, Fortunato is also a victim of extreme pride. For example, Montessor gave him numerous opportunities to turn back and go home. However, he refused the offers numerous times, trusting that Montresor would be true to his words regarding the Montellado. Paul's psychology is clearly known within both the narrator of the story as well as the victim in the story. For instance, Paul's darker desire can easily be portrayed through the eyes of Montresor while Fortunato's character reveals a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. While Po is clearly not Montresor and Montresor is not Po, it is worth noting that in Montresor, Po appears to have created a craftsman who is nearly his equal but whose purpose to run counter. For example, throughout Po's life, he seemed to suffer from a severe case of the Oedipus complex. At a young age, Paul's mother died from tuberculosis while his father had died from alcohol consumption. Paul was adopted into John Allen's family in which he and his adoptive father argued greatly over his gambling and alcohol problems. Furthermore, while attending school in Richmond, Paul was often excluded from the activities his peers engaged in as a result of his mother being an actress with very little money. This left Pa feeling isolated and thus relating very well to the cast of a Montellado. The fact that Montresor had killed Fortunato as a result of an insult to his family lineage could possibly be conveyed as him trying to obtain closure with the situation as Pa himself is trying to obtain closure. Furthermore, Pa's relation to the character Fortunato can be explained by the great amount of losses in his childhood mainly with important women figure in his life. After the death of both his mother and his foster mother and his numerous wives, Paul 
develop a form of paranoia of being alone. It is then logical that Fortunato, in a sense, acts as shadow of projection as he projects Paul's innermost feeling of hopelessness and abandonment. The fact that Montessor chose to break Fortunato in the vault on the far end illustrates this. All of the characters are struck with so many psychological concepts and hints of irony. Since Montresor possesses it, he is more vulnerable than the average individual to give in to his own temptations and desires despite how wrong they may be. By utilizing psychoanalytic literary criticism, we are able to understand the connection that manifested between Edgar Allan Poe and his characters. Furthermore, by reading the story, we are able to learn a broader understanding of Poe himself and with the environment around him.